Hi everybody, it's 9 o'clock and 9 o'clock is with me, Father Warner. We are in the Thursday of the 29th week in Ordinary Time. We continue to study a rather difficult book. It's in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I want to thank you for persevering. I know this has been a tough week when it comes to the study. Lots of words, lots of concepts, lots of theology, but God speaks to us. So we are looking at chapter 3, verse 14 to 21. And I've entitled today's teaching, Punctuated with Prayer. So let's read the text. If you want, please pause this video at this point of time. Listen to the text. But for those of you who might be traveling and listening to me, I'm going to read the text for you. For this reason, I know I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, before I begin teaching this text, um, I want to s remember in a very special way uh, the late Archbishop of Bombay, Cardinal Simon Pimenta, whose uh, motto was taken from these words, rooted and grounded in love. Uh, I'm uh, deeply grateful also to his family, who very kindly donated several of his personal effects to the Archdiocese and Heritage Museum. Now, in the text of yesterday, rather long teaching if you remember uh, we did Ephesians chapter 3 verse uh, 12 to uh, 2 to 12 uh, in yesterday's text Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12 it spoke of the boldness and the confidence remember that word the paresia the boldness and the confidence that we have both Jews and Gentiles to approach God why do we have this boldness because we have access through Jesus Christ now, this great mystery of unity, this unmerited salvation of all in Christ, this privilege of being joined to heirs in the promise of Jesus is the reason why the author to the Ephesians begins this text in verse 14 with an act of great humility. And he thanks and he bows his knees before the Father. Now, the author to the Ephesians punctuates his letter which he's writing with a moment of prayer. The prayer of Paul, now you notice very often I say author to the Ephesians and then I switch to Paul. As I said earlier, we don't know uh, who the author to the Ephesians is. We attribute it to Paul. So I will keep saying Paul says, Paul says, or I might say the author to the Ephesians. But the prayer of Paul begins with a publicly manifested action of reverence. Now, as an aside, external gestures of reverence are slowly fading in the Catholic Church. As one pastor once said, if your knees are giving way, bow at your hip. If your hip is giving way, bow at your neck. And if your neck has given way, close your eyes. And if that is not possible, find it in your heart to make an appropriate gesture of reverence according to your physical ability but acknowledge the great presence of God when you enter a church. And I make a special appeal to you, to all of you. Um, I myself genuflect, and I always say this to myself, as long as God allows my knees to bend, I will bend to him. So I encourage you to express actions of de devotedness, to God. Now, let me back this uh, with scripture. Solomon prayed on his knees. Read 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 54. Ezra prayed on his knees. Ezra chapter 9 verse 5. 
The psalmist called us to kneel, Psalm 95, 6. Daniel prayed on his knees. Read Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. People came to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verse 14, and chapter 20, verse 20. In Mark 1, 40, they came to Jesus kneeling. Stephen, our patron here at St. Stephen's, prayed on his knees. We read it in Acts chapter 7, verse 60. Peter prayed on his knees. See Acts chapter 9, verse 40. Paul prayed on his knees. See Acts chapter 20, verse 36. And the early Christians prayed on their knees. See Acts chapter 21, verse 5. Most importantly, Jesus prayed on his knees. Look at Luke chapter 22, verse 41. So give God some knee mail. K-N-E-E-M-A-I-L. Give God. It won't kill you to go down on your knees. And that is how it begins. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now, it is not merely the external gesture of prayer to which our attention is drawn. But our attention is also drawn today to the prayer itself. The prayer is made to the Father of Jesus. It is that prayer is that they may be spiritually, not just power in your muscles, they may be spiritually strengthened with the power. That word that he uses, power, in Greek is dunamis, a power that comes through the spirit. Now, I stretch, uh, stress that word dunamis because the Greek word dunamis, from which we get our English word dynamite, speaks of a special kind of power, the ability that God gives us to do or to accomplish. It is an enabling sort of power because it equips us to do good things while leaving us the freedom to exercise all that we do uh, with a sense of great power. But this measure of power, we are told, is given in, according, in accordance to the riches of his glory. Now, when you think of this, it's a fantastic prayer. The riches of God's glory are not limited. The riches of God's glory are infinite. So Paul is praying for God to shower these Ephesian Christians with not just some blessing, but with an infinite blessing. You know, I often think I don't like that hymn showers a blessing because it says mercy drops Round us are falling. It says, it's God, you know, says, okay, you're a little mercy, they're a little mess, mercy. No, God showers us with infinite blessings. Now, when you look at this uh, text of today, we'll see that Paul also moves to the second petition of his prayer. That second petition of his prayer is that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith as they were rooted and grounded in love. There are two powerful elements here. The prayer is an invitation for Christ to dwell, to live. The word dwell uses the ancient Greek word for making a permanent home. That Christ may make a permanent home. Jesus wants to settle down in our hearts, not just visit us as a stranger. That Christ may dwell forever in our home. He is our permanent guest in, of our lives. Yet the prayer, my dear friends, acknowledges that this dwelling is in need for spiritual strength that comes from faith because there is something in us that resists the influence of the indwelling of Jesus. That something can be conquered by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God gives us that victory of faith and allows Christ to dwell permanently within us. You know, as every gardener knows, um, plants depend on their roots for nature and sustenance. Yeah, he says, listen to what he says. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded. Plants depend on their roots for nurture and for sustenance. The roots might be underground and invisible to the casual observer, but they are absolutely essential to the well-being of the plant. But much also depends on the soil in which the roots are rooted. If the soil has uh, moisture and nu nutrients, the roots will extract those nutrients 
and feed the plant so that the plant can prosper. prosper. However, if the soil contains no moisture or nutrients, the roots will be helpless. They will be unable to support the life of the plant and then the plant will die. So, Paul says, may you be rooted and grounded in love. But Paul says that Christians have no reason to worry about the spiritual soil in which they are rooted. It is agape, it is love, it is in God's love that we are all planted, says Paul. The kind of love that a mother shows to a child, the kind of love that focuses on giving rather than giving. Now, we've covered two petitions of the prayer. Let's look at the third petition. The third petition of our prayer is found in verse 18. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of Christ's love that surpasses all knowledge. In short, Paul says, can you swim in his love that knows no bounds? A love, he says, that I pray that you will be able to comprehend. Yet a love, he says, that even though I pray you may, be, you may be able to comprehend, that love is incomprehensible. Now, that word that Paul uses, kata lambano, translated in English as to comprehend, kata lambano in Greek, translated in English as to comprehend, means more than comprehending or understanding. You see, the Greeks use this word to speak of reaching out to cross the finish line, to win the prize. Paul, therefore, in his third petition is praying that God will strengthen these Christians in Ephesus to enable them to reach out and to grasp the prize and to emerge victorious. And then we come to the fourth and the final petition of this prayer is that the believer may know the unmerited and the unconditional love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge so that they may be filled with the goodness of God. You know, many people today would find it nearly impossible to believe that Christians are filled with the fullness of God. Am I filled with all the fullness of God? Certainly, there are a few who would fit that description. If God has answered Paul's prayer in chapter 3 verse 14, and 19, then you and I are unlikely candidates who have indeed been filled with the fullness of God. But what we see is not what Paul prayed. Yet what seems impossible to man is possible to God if we allow him to work his power within us in order that we may accomplish all things beyond our imagination. Finally, finally, Jesus called the church to proclaim the glory of God in perpetuity. He says the last words in verse 21, forever and ever in perpetuity. That is how it has worked out. It has been 2000 years since Jesus walked the dusty pathways of Israel, but the church is still giving God glory. We are not only singing songs of glory in worship, but we are also proclaiming the gospel far and wide and feeding the hungry and healing the sick all over the world in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has called us. Who could have imagined such a thing? God imagined it. Jesus imagined it. Paul imagined it. And it took place just as they envisioned it. So, thank you for joining me again today in a rather interesting and, as I said, a little bit of a strain on the brain teaching. Listen to it again and again. Read the text and then stop the video, look at the text, listen to the video, go back to the text, listen to the video, and you'll see how chapter 3, yesterday's text and today's text, comes alive. Once again, as I've been saying this week, um, if you would like to receive our uh, texts of these teachings, you'd like to receive the links to these teachings, um, you need to resend me your details on this number 9152309626 that's plus 919152309626 we'll be flashing these numbers all through the next couple of weeks 
till all of you who have been knocked off my phone for some reason or the other can now uh, again be added. Remember, and I want to make this appeal to all of you, please do not, when you get a WhatsApp message from me, do not respond to it with an emoticon or say thank you father or good morning father. It adds to a lot of uh, additional work. So when you receive it, read it, pass it on, share it, like it, comment, but don't respond to it, okay? It takes up quite a lot of my time. So I'd like to leave you with a blessing today. The Lord be with you and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God be with you.